Although Dmitry Mendeleev gets most of the credit for inventing the periodic table, he was not the first to sense a hidden order among the elements. Ever since the early 1800s, when it was first proposed that each element had its own unique kind of atom, chemists had been working to determine their atomic weights, the amount an atom of each element weighed. And in 1817, more than 50 years before Mendeleev's first table was published, a German chemist named Johann Doberiner noticed a mathematical pattern in groups of three elements he called triads. One of the triads involves lithium, sodium, and potassium, three very similar elements. If you take the weight of lithium, the top member of that triad, and add it to the weight of potassium, which is the bottom member of the triad, and divide by two, you get approximately the weight of the middle element, sodium. Doberiner found another triad among the family of elements called the halogens, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, and a third among the alkaline earth metals, calcium, strontium, and barium. Doberiner's triads were a tantalizing clue, but for decades after, no one could order all the elements because there were so many competing systems of atomic weights. Did carbon weigh six or did it weigh 12? Did it weigh four? That depended on who you talked to and when you talked to them. By the late 1850s, people were incredibly confused. That changed in 1860, when chemists organized their first ever international meeting in Karlsruhe, Germany. There, an Italian chemist named Stanislao Canizzaro laid out a persuasive case for a new uniform system of atomic weights. I still remember the powerful impression Canizzaro made. He seemed to advocate truth itself. After Karlsruhe, something astonishing starts to happen. Within a few years of the Congress, you start seeing lots of different attempts to organize the elements that are all based on these new post-Karlsruhe weights. They emerge in France, they emerge in Britain, they emerge in Germany and in Russia, and they're all independent of each other. None of these people looked at what anybody else was doing. They just looked at the new atomic weights and noticed that certain patterns were starting to emerge. It began with a French geologist named Alexandre de Chancourtois. In 1862, he arranged the known elements in a spiral along the outside of a cylinder, like the stripes on a barber pole. And then if you look down a vertical column of the spiral, you could see chemically similar elements, like lithium, sodium, and potassium. De Chancourtois was the first person to realize that if you arrange the elements in order of increasing atomic weights, then every now and then you get a recurrence in the properties of the elements. This is the essential discovery of chemical periodicity. But de Chancourtois' paper, published in a geology journal, attracted little attention. And when he submitted his paper to the publisher, the publisher lost the diagram. And of course, on something like the periodic system, the diagram is absolutely essential. He was forgotten, he was neglected, it took several other people 30 years later to point out that the Chancourtois had technically arrived at the periodic system first. The next to give it a go was a British chemist named John Newlands. Newlands was a sugar chemist, an industrial chemist working in London. He was able to come up with a very respectable periodic system, which he then presented to the British Chemical Society and was essentially laughed out of court. Newlands had arranged the elements by atomic weights in rows of seven and found that their properties repeated like musical notes one octave apart. Newlands called this the law of octaves. He used the idea of octaves because there's a rather good analogy between octaves in music, the fact that the musical scale repeats after a certain interval. You have the note C, of course, and after eight notes you arrive at C again. And he was pointing out that there's a similarity in the elements in that you can have, for instance, lithium, and then you can run through several elements, and then you can get an element that's like lithium, namely sodium. So because Newlands dared to make that analogy, which he only intended it as an analogy, people began to think that this guy was a complete crank. Not only was, a was he a sugar chemist and, he and an industrialist, but he was daring to make outlandish suggestions about analogies between music and chemistry. Another British chemist who came up with a perfectly decent periodic system was Odling, who, unlike Newlands, was a prominent academic chemist. 
He had been at the Karlsruhe conference. There was a Danish-born chemist and mineralogist called Heinrichs who fled to the United States when he was a young man. He came up with a very interesting and rather original periodic system which is arranged like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. And the closest competitor to Mendeleev is the German chemist Lothar Meyer. In 1868, Meyer drafted a nearly complete table of elements, but he too was done in by his publisher. The table was misplaced and not published until long after Mendeleev's appeared the following year. Discoveries in science are frequently made simultaneously uh, because the data is available to everyone and people arrive at the same conclusion from different standpoints. And, and this is a good case in point. Over a period of about seven or eight years, six people independently arrived at the periodic system. There's a sweet spot in the 1860s where you have 63 elements that you can look at. That's a good number. It's not too few, so you can start to see patterns. And it's not too many, so you get washed away in noise. And it turns out when you have those circumstances, people in very different contexts begin to find very similar it's curious because Mendeleev gets the most credit, but Mendeleev is actually the last of six discoverers of the periodic system. So why is Mendeleev considered the father of the periodic table? One reason is that he alone among the six discoverers believed his table revealed a law of nature. He had an almost mystical feeling that this was there in nature and not so much a human invention as a, as a discovery. The remarkable regularity of his table convinced Mendeleev that the empty spaces would someday be filled by elements that hadn't been discovered yet. Laws of nature do not permit exceptions. There must be an element which we have not yet discovered. Go look for that element. And he was bold enough to not only to say uh, an element is missing, but to predict. The periodic law allows us not only to predict what new element will be found, but also to determine in advance their chemical and physical properties. In 1871, Mendeleev published an article making predictions about three missing elements for which he'd left room in the table. Chemists really weren't used to making predictions of any kind, let alone ones to this degree of specificity. They are remarkably precise and quite daring for Mendeleev to print them. Four years later, a French chemist found a new metal so soft it melted in his hand. He called it gallium. It seemed to be a good fit for the empty spot below aluminum, but the density didn't match Mendeleev's prediction. He wrote the Frenchman, suggesting that he check his data. So you can just imagine this Frenchman who actually has the element in his hands hearing from this Siberian who has never seen the element and daring to say to him that he's made a mistake. But sure enough, when the French scientist rechecked his measurements, Mendeleev was correct. So not only had Mendeleev predicted the element, but he knew the properties of the element better than the discoverer of the element knew them. Within 15 years, all three of the detailed predictions are discovered, and that catapults Mendeleev to chemical superstardom. The fact that the three elements were all discovered and all coincided exactly with his predictions, this showed what a great grasp he had of chemical and physical properties, how sure he was of periodicity. He could stick his neck out as the other five discoverers of periodic tables never did in the same way. There's a certain inevitability about the periodic table. Um, it is an objective, real fact that the elements recur every so often. The thing that was confusing was that people were groping towards this knowledge with inadequate data, confusing data. But the more those various pieces of information became clarified, then people were just simply converging on the inevitable truth that if you arrange the elements in a sequence of increasing atomic weight, every so often you get a repetition in chemical properties.